Running Wolf The man who enjoys an adventure outside the general experience of the race and imparts it to others must not be surprised if he is taken for either a liar or a fool, as Malcolm Hyde, hotel clerk on a holiday, discovered in due course. Nor is enjoy the right word to use in describing his emotions. The word he chose was probably survive. When he first set eyes on Medicine Lake, he was struck by its still sparkling beauty, lying there in the vast Canadian backwoods, next by its extreme loneliness, and lastly, a good deal later this, by its combination of beauty, loneliness, and singular atmosphere, due to the fact that it was the scene of his adventure. "'That's fairly stiff with big fish,' said Morton of the Montreal Sporting Club. "'Spend your holiday up there. Mottawa way, some fifteen miles west of Stony Creek. You'll have it all to yourself except for an old Indian who's got a shack there. Camp on the east side if you'll take a tip from me.' He then talked for a half an hour about the wonderful sport, yet he was not otherwise very communicative, and did not suffer questions gladly, I'd noticed. Nor had he stayed there very long himself. If it was such a paradise as Morton, its discoverer in the most experienced rod in the province, claimed, why had he himself spent only three days there? Ran short of grub, was the explanation offered, but to another friend he had mentioned briefly, flies, and to a third, so Hyde learned later, he gave the excuse that his half-breed took sick, necessitating a quick return to civilization. Hyde, however, cared little for the explanations. His interest in these came later. Stiff with fish was the phrase he liked. He took the Canadian Pacific train to Mattawa, laid in his outfit at Stony Creek, and set off thence for the fifteen-mile canoe trip without a care in the world. Traveling light, the portages did not trouble him. The water was swift and easy, the rapids negotiable. Everything came his way, as the saying is. Occasionally he saw big fish making for deeper pools, and was sorely tempted to stop, but he resisted. He pushed on between the immense world of forests that stretched for hundreds of miles, known to deer, bear, moose, and wolf, but strange to any echo of human tread, a deserted and primeval wilderness. The autumn day was calm, the water sang and sparkled, the blue sky hung cloudless over all, ablaze with light. Toward evening he passed an old beaver dam, rounded a little point, and had his first sight of Medicine Lake. He lifted his dripping paddle. The canoe shot with silent glide into calm water. He gave an exclamation of delight, for the loveliness caught his breath away. Though primarily a sportsman, he was not insensible to beauty. The lake formed a crescent, perhaps four miles long, its width between a mile and half a mile. The slanting gold of sunset flooded it. No wind stirred its crystal surface. Here it had lain since the redskins God first made it. Here it would lie until he dried it up again. Towering spruce and hemlock trooped to its very edge. Majestic cedars leaned down as if to drink. Crimson sumacs shone in fiery patches, and maples gleamed orange and red beyond belief. The air was like wine, with the silence of a dream. It was here the red men formerly made medicine, with all the wild ritual and tribal ceremony of an ancient day. But it was of Morton, rather than of Indians, that Hyde thought. If this lonely, hidden paradise was really stiff with big fish, he owed a lot to Morton for the information. Peace invaded him, but the excitement of the hunter lay below. He looked about him with quick, practiced eye for a camping place before the sun sank below the forests and the half-lights came. The Indian's shack, lying in full sunshine on the eastern shore, he found it once, but the trees lay too thick about it for comfort, nor did he wish to be so close to its inhabitant. Upon the opposite side, however, an ideal clearing offered. This lay already in shadow, the huge forest darkening it toward evening, but the open space attracted. He paddled over quickly and examined it. The ground was hard and dry, he found, and a little brook ran tinkling down one side of it into the lake. This outfall, too, would be a good fishing spot. Also, it was sheltered. A few low willows marked the mouth. An experienced camper soon makes up his mind. It was a perfect sight, and some charred logs with traces of former fires proved that he was not the first to think so. Hyde was delighted. 
Then suddenly disappointment came to tinge his pleasure. His kit was landed, and preparations for putting up the tent were begun, when he recalled a detail that excitement had so far kept in the background of his mind. Morton's advice. But not Morton's only, for the storekeeper at Stony Creek had reinforced it. The big fellow with straggling mustache and stooping shoulders, dressed in shirt and trousers, had handed him out a final sentence with the bacon, flour, condensed milk, and sugar. He had repeated Morton's half-forgotten words. Put your tent on the east shore, I should. He had said at parting. He remembered Morton, too, apparently. A shortish fellow, brown as an Indian, and fairly smelling of the woods. Traveling with Jake, the half-breed. That assuredly was Morton. Didn't stay long now, did he? He added in a reflective tone. Going Windy Lakeway, are you? Or Ten Mile Water, maybe? He had first inquired of Hyde. Medicine Lake. Is that so? The man said, as though he doubted it for some obscure reason. He pulled at his ragged mustache a moment. Is that so now? He repeated, and the final words followed him downstream after a considerable pause. The advice about the best shore on which to put his tent. All this now suddenly flashed back upon Hyde's mind, with a tinge of disappointment and annoyance, for when two experienced men agreed, their opinion was not to be lightly disregarded. He wished he had asked the storekeeper for more details. He looked about him, he reflected. He hesitated. His ideal camping ground lay certainly on the forbidden shore. What in the world, he pondered, could be the objection to it? But the light was fading. He must decide quickly one way or the other. After staring at his unpacked dunnage in the tent, already half erected, he made up his mind with a muttered expression that consigned both Morton and the storekeeper to less pleasant places. They must have some reason, he growled to himself. Fellows like that usually know what they're talking about. I guess I'd better shift over to the other side, for tonight at any rate. He glanced across the water before actually reloading. No smoke rose from the Indian's shack. He had seen no sign of a canoe. The man, he decided, was away. Reluctantly, then, he left the good camping ground and paddled across the lake, and half an hour later, his tent was up, firewood collected, and two small trout were already caught for supper. But the bigger fish, he knew, lay waiting for him on the other side by the little outfall, and he fell asleep at length on his bed of balsam boughs, annoyed and disappointed, yet wondering how a mere sentence could have persuaded him so easily against his own better judgment. He slept like the dead. The sun was well up before he stirred. But his morning mood was a very different one. The brilliant light, the peace, the intoxicating air, all this was too exhilarating for the mind to harbor foolish fancies, and he marveled that he could have been so weak the night before. No hesitation lay in him anywhere. He struck camp immediately after breakfast, paddled back across the strip of shining water, and quickly settled in upon the forbidden shore, as he now called it, with a contemptuous grin and the more he saw of the spot, the better he liked it. There was plenty of wood, running water to drink, an open space about the tent, and there were no flies. The fishing, moreover, was magnificent. Morton's description was fully justified, and stiff with big fish, for once, was not an exaggeration. The useless hours of the afternoon he passed dozing in the sun, or wandering through the underbrush beyond the camp. He found no sign of anything unusual. He bathed in a cool, deep pool. He reveled in the lonely little paradise. Lonely, it certainly was, but the loneliness was part of its charm. The stillness, the peace, the isolation of this beautiful backwoods lake delighted him. The silence was divine. He was entirely satisfied. After a brew of tea, he strolled toward evening along the shore, looking for the first sign of a rising fish. A faint ripple on the water with the lengthening shadows, made good conditions. Plop followed plop, as the big fellows rose, snatched at their food, and vanished into the depths. He hurried back. Ten minutes later, he had taken his rods, and was gliding cautiously in the canoe through the quiet water. So good was the sport indeed, and so quickly did the big trout pile up in the bottom of the canoe, that, despite the growing lateness, he found it hard to tear himself away. One more, he said, and then I really will go. He landed that one more and was in act of taking it off the hook when the deep silence of the evening was curiously disturbed. He became abruptly aware that someone watched him. A pair of 
eyes, it seemed, were fixed upon him and from some point in the surrounding shadows. Thus at least he interpreted the odd disturbance in his happy mood, for thus he felt it. The feeling stole over him without the slightest warning. He was not alone. The slippery big trout dropped from his fingers. He sat motionless and stared about him. Nothing stirred. The ripple on the lake had died away. There was no wind. The forest lay a single purple mass of shadow. The yellow sky, fast fading, threw reflections that troubled the eye and made distances uncertain. But there was no sound, no movement. He saw no figure anywhere. Yet he knew that someone watched him. And a wave of quite unreasoning terror gripped him. The nose on the canoe was against the bank. In a moment, and instinctively, he shoved it off and paddled into deeper water. The watcher, it came to him also instinctively, was quite close to him upon the bank. But where and who? Was it the Indian? Here in deeper water and some twenty yards from the shore, he paused and strained both sight and hearing to find some possible clue. He felt half ashamed now that the first strange feeling passed a little, but the certainty remained. Absurd as it was, he felt positive that someone watched him with concentrated and intent regard. Every fiber in his being told him so. And though he could discover no figure, no new outline on the shore, he could even have sworn in which clump of willow bushes the hidden person crouched and stared. His attention seemed drawn to that particular clump. The water dripped slowly from his paddle, now lying across the thwarts. There was no other sound. The canvas of his tent gleamed dimly. A star or two were out. He waited. Nothing happened. Then, as suddenly as it had come, the feeling passed, and he knew that the person who had been watching him intently had gone. It was as if a current had been turned off. The normal world flowed back. The landscape emptied as if someone had left a room. The disagreeable feeling left him at the same time, so that he instantly turned the canoe in to the shore again, landed, and paddle in hand, went over to examine the clump of willows he had singled out as the place of concealment. There was no one there, of course, nor any trace of recent human occupancy. No leaves, no branches stirred, nor was a single twig displaced. His keen and practiced sight detected no sign of tracks upon the ground. Yet, for all that, he felt positive that a little time ago someone had crouched among these very leaves and watched him. He remained absolutely convinced of it. The watcher, whether Indian, hunter, stray lumberman, or wandering half-breed, had now withdrawn. The search was useless, and dusk was falling. He returned to his little camp, more disturbed perhaps than he cared to acknowledge. He cooked his supper hung up his catch on a string so that no prowling animal could get at it during the night, and prepared to make himself comfortable until bedtime. Unconsciously, he built a bigger fire than usual, and found himself peering over his pipe into the deep shadows beyond the firelight, straining his ears to catch the slightest sound. He remained generally on the alert in a way that was new to him. A man under such conditions and in such a place need not know discomfort, until the sense of loneliness strikes him as too vivid a reality. Loneliness in a backwoods camp brings charm, pleasure, and a happy sense of calm until, and unless, it comes too near. It should remain an ingredient only among other conditions. It should not be directly, vividly noticed. Once it has crept within short range, however, it may easily cross the narrow line between comfort and discomfort, and darkness is an undesirable time for the transition. A curious dread may easily follow, the dread lest the loneliness suddenly be disturbed and the solitary human feel himself open to attack. For Hyde now, this transition had been already accomplished. The too intimate sense of his loneliness had shifted abruptly into the worst condition of no longer being quite alone. It was an awkward moment, and the hotel clerk realized his position exactly. He did not quite like it. He sat there, with his back to the blazing logs, a very visible object in the light, while all about him the darkness of the forest lay like an impenetrable wall. 
He could not see a foot beyond the small circle of his campfire. The silence about him was like the silence of the dead. No leaf rustled. No wave lapped. He himself sat motionless as a log. Then again he became suddenly aware that the person who watched him had returned, and that same intent and concentrated gaze as before was fixed upon him where he lay. There was no warning. He heard no stealthy tread or snapping of dry twigs, yet the owner of those steady eyes was very close to him, probably not a dozen feet away. The sense of proximity was overwhelming. It is unquestionable that a shiver ran down his spine. This time, moreover, he felt positive that the man crouched just beyond the firelight, the distance he himself could see being nicely calculated, and straight in front of him. For some minutes he sat without stirring a single muscle, yet with each muscle ready and alert, straining his eyes in vain to pierce the darkness, but only succeeding in dazzling his sight with the reflected light. Then, as he shifted his position slowly, cautiously, to obtain another angle of vision, his heart gave two big thumps against his ribs, and the hair seemed to rise on his scalp with a sense of cold that shot horribly up his spine. In the darkness facing him, he saw two small and greenish circles that were certainly a pair of eyes. Yet not the eyes of Indian, hunter, or of any human being. It was a pair of animal eyes that stared so fixedly at him out of the night. And this certainly had an immediate and natural effect upon him. For at the menace of those eyes, the fears of millions of long-dead hunters since the dawn of time woke in him. Hotel clerk though he was, heredity surged through him in an automatic wave of instinct. His hand groped for a weapon. His fingers fell on the iron head of his small camp axe. And at once he was himself again. Confidence returned. The vague, superstitious dread was gone. This was a bear or wolf that smelt his catch and came to steal it. With beings of that sort, he knew instinctively how to deal, yet admitting, by this very instinct, that his original dread had been of quite another kind. "'I'll damned quick find out what it is!' he exclaimed aloud, and snatching a burning brand from the fire, he hurled it with good aim straight at the eyes of the beast before him. The bit of pitch pine fell in a shower of sparks that lit the dry grass this side of the animal, flared up a moment, then died quickly down again. But in that instant of bright illumination, he saw clearly what his unwelcome visitor was. A big timber wolf sat on its hindquarters, staring steadily at him through the firelight. He saw its legs and shoulders. He saw its hair. He saw also the big hemlock trunks lit up behind it and the willow scrub on each side. It formed a vivid, clear-cut picture shown in clear detail by the momentary blaze. To his amazement, however, the wolf did not turn and bolt away from the burning log, but withdrew a few yards only, and sat there again on its haunches, staring, staring as before. Heavens, how it stared! He shooed it, but without effect. It did not budge. He did not waste another good log on it, for his fear was dissipated now. A timber wolf was a timber wolf, and it might sit there as long as it pleased, provided it did not try to steal his catch. No alarm was in him any more. He knew that wolves were harmless in the summer and autumn, and even when packed in the winter, they would attack a man only when suffering desperate hunger. So he lay and watched the beast, threw bits of stick in its direction, even talked to it, wondering only that it never moved. You can stay there forever if you like, he remarked to it out loud, for you cannot get at my fish, and the rest of the grub I shall take into the tent with me. The creature blinked its bright green eyes, but made no move. Why then, if his fear was gone, did he think of certain things as he rolled himself in the Hudson Bay blankets before going to sleep? The immobility of the animal was strange. Its refusal to turn and bolt was still stranger. Never before had he known a wild creature that was not afraid of fire. Why did it sit and watch him, as with purpose in its dreadful eyes? How had he felt its presence earlier and instantly? A timber wolf, especially a solitary timber wolf, was a timid thing, yet this one feared neither man nor fire. Now, as he lay there, wrapped in his blankets inside the cozy tent, 
It sat outside beneath the stars, beside the fading embers, the wind chilly in its fur, the ground cooling beneath its planted paws, watching him, steadily watching him, perhaps until the dawn. It was unusual. It was strange. Having neither imagination nor tradition, he called upon no store of racial visions. Matter of fact, a hotel clerk on a fishing holiday, he lay there in his blankets, merely wondering and puzzled. A timber wolf was a timber wolf, and nothing more. Yet, this timber wolf, the idea haunted him, was different. In a word, the deeper part of his original uneasiness remained. He tossed about. He shivered sometimes in his broken sleep. He did not go out to sea, but he woke early and unrefreshed. Again, with the sunshine and the morning wind, however, the incident of the night before was forgotten, almost unreal. His hunting zeal was uppermost. The tea and fish were delicious. His pipe had never tasted so good. The glory of this lonely lake amid primeval forests went to his head a little. He was a hunter before the Lord and nothing else. He tried the edge of the lake, and in the excitement of playing a big fish, knew suddenly that it, the wolf, was there. He paused with the rod, exactly as if struck. He looked about him. He looked in a definite direction. The brilliant sunshine made every smallest detail clear and sharp. Boulders of granite, burned stems, crimson sumac, pebbles along the shore in neat separate detail without revealing where the watcher hid. Then his sight wandering farther inshore among the tangled undergrowth, he suddenly picked up the familiar half-expected outline. The wolf was lying behind a granite boulder, so that only the head, the muzzle, and the eyes were visible. It merged in its background. Had he not known it was a wolf, he could never have separated it from the landscape. The eyes shone in the sunlight. There it lay, he looked straight at it. Their eyes, in fact, actually met, full and square. "'Great Scott!' he exclaimed aloud. "'Why, it's like looking at a human being!' From that moment, unwittingly, he established a singular personal relation with the beast. And what followed confirmed this undesirable impression, for the animal rose instantly and came down in leisurely fashion to the shore, where it stood looking back at him. It stood and stared into his eyes like some great wild dog, so that he was aware of a new and almost incredible sensation, that it courted recognition. Well, well, he exclaimed again, relieving his feelings by addressing it aloud. If this doesn't beat everything I ever saw, what do you want, anyway? He examined it now more carefully. He had never seen a wolf so big before. It was a tremendous beast, a nasty customer to tackle, he reflected, if it ever came to that. It stood there absolutely fearless and full of confidence. In the clear sunlight, he took in every detail of it. A huge, shaggy, lean-flanked timber wolf, its wicked eyes staring straight into his own, almost with a kind of purpose in them. He saw its great jaws, its teeth, and its tongue hung out, dropping saliva a little. And yet the idea of its savagery, its fierceness, was very little in him. He was amazed and puzzled beyond belief. He wished the Indian would come back. He did not understand this strange behavior in an animal. Its eyes, the odd expression in them, gave him a queer, unusual, difficult feeling. Had his nerves gone wrong, he almost wondered. The beast stood on the shore and looked at him. He wished for the first time that he had brought a rifle. With a resounding smack, he brought his paddle down flat upon the water, using all his strength till the echoes rang as from a pistol shot that was audible from one end of the lake to the other. The wolf never stirred. He shouted, but the beast remained unmoved. He blinked his eyes, speaking as to a dog, a domestic animal, a creature accustomed to human ways. It blinked its eyes in return. At length, increasing his distance from the shore, he continued fishing, and the excitement of the marvelous sport held his attention, his surface attention at any rate. At times he almost forgot the attendant beast, yet whenever he looked up he saw it there, and worse. When he slowly paddled home again, he observed it 
trotting along the shore as though to keep him company. Crossing a little bay, he spurted, hoping to reach the other point before his undesired and undesirable attendant. Instantly, the brute broke into that rapid, tireless lope that, except on ice, can run down anything on four legs in the woods. When he reached the distant point, the wolf was waiting for him. He raised his paddle from the water, pausing a moment for reflection, for this very close attention. There were dusk and night yet to come. He certainly did not relish. His camp was near. He had to land. He felt uncomfortable even in the sunshine of broad day when, to his keen relief about half a mile from the tent, he saw the creature suddenly stop and sit down in the open. He waited a moment, then paddled on. It did not follow. There was no attempt to move. It merely sat and watched him. After a few hundred yards, he looked back. It was still sitting where he left it. And the absurd yet significant feeling came to him that the beast divined his thought, his anxiety, his dread, and was now showing him, as well as it could, that it entertained no hostile feeling and did not meditate attack. He turned the canoe toward the shore. He landed. He cooked his supper in the dusk. The animal made no sign. Not far away it certainly lay and watched, but it did not advance. And a hide, observant now in a new way, came one sharp, vivid reminder of the strange atmosphere into which his commonplace personality had strayed. He suddenly recalled that his relations with the beast, already established, had progressed distinctly a stage further. This startled him, yet without the accompanying alarm he must certainly have felt twenty-four hours before. He had an understanding with the wolf. He was aware of friendly thoughts toward it. He even went so far as to set out a few big fish on the spot where he had first seen it sitting the previous night. If he comes, he thought, he is welcome to them. I've got plenty anyway. He thought of it now as he. Yet the wolf made no appearance until he was in the act of entering his tent a good deal later. It was close on ten o'clock, whereas nine was his hour and late at that for turning in. He had therefore unconsciously been waiting for him. Then, as he was closing the flap, he saw the eyes close to where he had placed the fish. He waited, hiding himself, and expecting to hear sounds of munching jaws. But all was silence. Only the eyes glowed steadily out of the background of pitch darkness. He closed the flap. He had no slightest fear. In ten minutes he was sound asleep. He could not have slept very long. For when he woke up, he could see the shine of a faint red light through the canvas, and the fire had not died down completely. He rose and cautiously peeped out. The air was very cold. He saw his breath. But he also saw the wolf, for it had come in, and was sitting by the dying embers, not two yards away from where he crouched behind the flap. And this time, at these very close quarters, there was something in the attitude of the big wild thing that caught his attention with a vivid thrill of startled surprise and a sudden shock of cold that held him spellbound. He stared, unable to believe his eyes, for the wolf's attitude conveyed to him something familiar that at first he was unable to explain. Its pose reached him in the terms of another thing with which he was entirely at home. What was it? Did his senses betray him? Was he still asleep and dreaming? Then suddenly... With a start of uncanny recognition, he knew. Its attitude was that of a dog. Having found the clue, his mind then made an awful leap. For it was, after all, no dog its appearance aped, but something nearer to himself and more familiar still. Good heavens, it sat there with the pose, the attitude, the gesture in repose of something almost human. And then, with a second shock of biting wonder, it came to him like a revelation. The wolf sat beside the campfire as a man might sit. Before he could weigh his extraordinary discovery, before he could examine it in detail or with care, the animal, sitting in this ghastly fashion, seemed to feel his eyes fixed on it. It slowly turned and looked him in the face. And for the first time, Hyde felt a full-blooded superstitious fear flood through his entire being. He seemed transfixed with that nameless terror that is said to attack human beings who
who suddenly face the dead, finding themselves bereft of speech and movement. This moment of paralysis certainly occurred. Its passing, however, was as singular as its advent, for almost at once he was aware of something beyond and above this mockery of human attitude and pose, something that ran along unaccustomed nerves and reached his feeling, even perhaps his heart. The revulsion was extraordinary, its result still more extraordinary and unexpected. Yet, the fact remains. He was aware of another thing that had the effect of stilling his terror as soon as it was born. He was aware of appeal, silent, half-expressed, yet vastly pathetic. He saw in the savage eyes a beseeching, even a yearning, expression that changed his mood as by magic from dread to natural sympathy. The great gray brute, symbol of cruel ferocity, sat there beside his dying fire and appealed for help. This gulf betwixt animal and human seemed in that instant bridged. It was, of course, incredible. Hyde, sleep still possibly clinging to his inner being with the shades and half-shapes of dream yet about his soul, acknowledged, how he knew not, the amazing fact. He found himself nodding to the brute in half-consent, and instantly, without more ado, the lean gray shape rose like a wraith and trotted off swiftly, but with stealthy tread into the background of the night. When Hyde woke in the morning, his first impression was that he must have dreamed the entire incident. His practical nature asserted itself. There was a bite in the fresh autumn air. The bright sun allowed no half-lights anywhere. He felt brisk in mind and body. Reviewing what had happened, he came to the conclusion that it was utterly vain to speculate. No possible explanation of the animal's behavior occurred to him. He was dealing with something entirely outside his experience. His fear, however, had completely left him. The odd sense of friendliness remained. The beast had a definite purpose, and he himself was included in that purpose. His sympathy held good. But with this sympathy, there was also an intense curiosity. If it shows itself again, he told himself, I'll go up close and find out what it wants. The fish laid out the night before had not been touched. It must have been a full hour after breakfast when he next saw the brute. It was standing on the edge of the clearing, looking at him in the way now become familiar. Hyde immediately picked up his axe and advanced toward it boldly, keeping his eyes fixed straight upon his own. There was nervousness in him, but kept well under. Nothing betrayed it. Step by step he drew nearer until some ten yards separated them. The wolf had not stirred a muscle as yet. Its jaws hung open. Its eyes observed him intently. It allowed him to approach without a sign of what its mood might be. Then, with these ten yards between them, it turned abruptly and moved slowly off, looking back first over one shoulder and then over the other, exactly as a dog might do, to see if he was following. A singular journey it was they then made together, animal and man. The trees surrounded them at once, for they left the lake behind them, entering the tangled bush beyond. The beast, Hyde noticed, obviously picked the easiest track for him to follow, for obstacles that meant nothing to the four-legged expert, yet were difficult for a man, were carefully avoided with an almost uncanny skill, while yet the general direction was accurately kept. Occasionally there were windfalls to be surmounted, but though the wolf bounded over these with ease, it was always waiting for the man on the other side after he had laboriously climbed over. Deeper and deeper into the heart of the lonely forest they penetrated in the singular fashion, cutting across the arc of the lake's crescent, it seemed to hide. For after two miles or so, he recognized the big rocky bluff that overhung the water at its northern end. This outstanding bluff he had seen from his camp, one side of it falling sheer into the water, it was probably the spot he imagined where the Indians held their medicine-making ceremonies, for it stood out in isolated fashion, and its top formed a private plateau not easy of access. And it was here, close to a big spruce at the foot of the bluff, upon the forest side, that the wolf stopped suddenly, and for the first time since its appearance gave audible expression to its feelings. It sat down on its haunches, lifted its muzzle with open jaws, and gave vent to a subdued and long-drawn howl 
that was more like the wail of a dog than the fierce barking cry associated with a wolf. By this time, Hyde had lost not only fear, but caution, too. Nor, oddly enough, did this warning howl revive a sign of unwelcome emotion in him. In that curious sound, he detected the same message that the eyes conveyed. Appeal for help. He paused nevertheless, a little startled, and while the wolf sat waiting for him, he looked about him quickly. There was young timber here. It had once been a small clearing, evidently. Axe and fire had done their work, but there was evidence to an experienced eye that it was Indians and not white men who had once been busy here. Some part of the medicine ritual, doubtless, took place in the little clearing, thought the man, as he advanced again towards his patient leader. The end of their queer journey, he felt, was close at hand. He had not taken two steps before the animal got up and moved very slowly in the direction of some low bushes that formed a clump just beyond. It entered these, first looking back to make sure that its companion watched. The bushes hit it. A moment later it emerged again. Twice it performed this pantomime, each time as it reappeared, standing still and staring at the man with as distinct an expression of appeal in the eyes as an animal may compass, probably. Its excitement, meanwhile, certainly increased, and this excitement was, with equal certainty, communicated to the man. Hyde made up his mind quickly. Gripping his axe tightly, and ready to use it at the first hint of malice, he moved slowly nearer to the bushes, wondering with something of a tremor what would happen. If he expected to be startled, his expectation was at once fulfilled, but it was the behavior of the beast that made him jump. It positively frisked about him like a happy dog. It frisked for joy. Its excitement was intense, yet from its open mouth no sound was audible. With a sudden leap then, it bounded past him into the clump of bushes against whose very edge he stood, and began scraping vigorously at the ground. Hyde stood and stared, amazement and interest now banishing all his nervousness. Even when the beast, in its violent scraping, actually touched his body with its own, he had, perhaps, the feeling that he was in a dream, one of those fantastic dreams in which things may happen without involving an adequate surprise. For otherwise, the manner of scraping and scratching at the ground must have seemed an impossible phenomenon. No wolf, no dog, certainly, used its paws in the way those paws were working. Hyde had the odd, distressing sensation that it was hands, not paws, he watched. And yet somehow the natural, adequate surprise he should have felt was absent. The strange action seemed not entirely unnatural. In his heart some deep hidden spring of sympathy and pity stirred instead. He was aware of pathos. The wolf stopped in its task and looked up into his face. Hyde acted without hesitation then. Afterwards he was wholly at a loss to explain his own conduct. It seemed he knew what to do, divined what was asked, expected of him. Between his mind and the dumb desire yearning through the savage animal, there was intelligent and intelligible communication. He cut a stake and sharpened it, for the stones would blunt his axe edge. He entered the clump of bushes to complete the digging his four-legged companion had begun. And while he worked, though he did not forget the close proximity of the wolf, he paid no attention to it. Often his back was turned as he stooped over the laborious clearing away of the hard earth. No uneasiness or sense of danger was in him any more. The wolf sat outside the clump and watched the operations. Its concentrated attention, its patience, its intense eagerness, the gentleness and docility of the gray, fierce, and probably hungry brute. Its obvious pleasure and satisfaction, too, at having won the human to its mysterious purpose. These were colors in the strange picture that Hyde thought of later when dealing with the human herd in his hotel again. At the moment, he was aware chiefly of pathos and affection. The whole business was, of course, not to be believed. But that discovery came later, too, when telling it to others. The digging continued for fully half an hour before his labor was rewarded by the discovery of a small, whitish object. He picked it up and examined it. The finger bone of a man. Other discoveries then followed quickly and in quantity. The cache was laid bare. He collected nearly the complete skeleton. The skull, however, he found last, and might not have found it all but for the guidance of his strangely alert companion. It lay some few yards away from the central hole now dug, and the wolf stood 
nuzzling the ground with its nose before Hyde understood that he was meant to dig exactly in that spot for it. Between the beast's very paws, his stake struck hard upon it. He scraped the earth from the bone and examined it carefully. It was perfect, save for the fact that some wild animal had gnawed it, the teeth marks being still plainly visible. Close beside it lay the rusty iron head of a tomahawk. This and the smallness of the bones confirmed him in his judgment that it was the skeleton not of a white man, but of an Indian. During the excitement of the discovery of the bones one by one, and finally of the skull, but more especially during the period of intense interest while Hyde was examining them, he had paid little, if any, attention to the wolf. He was aware that it sat and watched him, never moving its keen eyes for a single moment from the actual operations. But of sign or movement it made none at all. He knew that it was pleased and satisfied. He knew also that he had now fulfilled its purpose in a great measure. The further intuition that now came to him, derived, he felt positive from his companion's dumb desire, was perhaps the cream of the entire experience to him. Gathering the bones together in his coat, he carried them, together with the tomahawk, to the foot of the big spruce where the animal had first stopped. His leg actually touched the creature's muzzle as he passed. It turned its head to watch but did not follow, nor did it move a muscle while he prepared the platform of boughs upon which he then laid the poor worn bones of an Indian who had been killed, doubtless, in sudden attack or ambush, and to whose remains had been denied the last grace of proper tribal burial. He wrapped the bones in bark, he laid the tomahawk beside the skull, he lit the circular fire round the pyre, and the blue smoke rose upward into the clear bright sunshine of the Canadian autumn morning till it was lost among the mighty trees far overhead. In the moment before actually lighting the little fire, he had turned to note what his companion did. It sat five yards away, he saw, gazing intently, and one of its front paws was raised a little from the ground. It made no sign of any kind. He finished the work, becoming so absorbed in it that he had eyes for nothing but the tending and guarding of his careful ceremonial fire. It was only when the platform of boughs collapsed, laying their charred burden gently on the fragrant earth among the soft wood ashes, that he turned again, as though to show the wolf what he had done, and seek perhaps some look of satisfaction in its curiously expressive eyes. But the place he searched was empty. The wolf had gone. He did not see it again. It gave no sign of its presence anywhere. He was not watched. He fished as before, wandered through the bush about his camp, sat smoking round his fire after dark, and slept peacefully in his cozy little tent. He was not disturbed. No howl was ever audible in the distant forest. No twig snapped beneath a stealthy tread. He saw no eyes. The wolf that behaved like a man had gone forever. It was the day before he left that Hyde, noticing smoke rising from the shack across the lake, paddled over to exchange a word or two with the Indian, who had evidently now returned. The redskin came down to meet him as he landed, but it was soon plain that he spoke very little English. He emitted the familiar grunts at first. Then, bit by bit, Hyde stirred his limited vocabulary into action. The net result, however, was slight enough, though it was certainly direct. "'You camp there?' the man asked, pointing to the other side. "'Yes?' "'Wolf come?' "'Yes.' "'You see wolf?' "'Yes.' The Indian stared at him fixedly a moment, a keen, wondering look upon his coppery-creased face. "'You afraid, wolf?' he asked, after a moment's pause. "'No,' replied Hyde, truthfully. He knew it was useless to ask questions of his own, though he was eager for information. The other would have told him nothing. It was sheer luck that the man had touched on the subject at all, and Hyde realized that his own best role was merely to answer— but to ask no questions. Then, suddenly, the Indian became comparatively voluble. There was awe in his voice and manner. Him no wolf. Him big medicine wolf. Him spirit wolf. Whereupon he drank the tea the other had brewed for him, closed his lips tightly, and said no more. His outline was discernible on the shore, rigid and motionless an hour later, when Hyde's canoe turned the corner of the lake three miles away, and landed to make the portages up the first rapid of his homeward stream. 
It was Morton who, after some persuasion, supplied further details of what he called the legend. Some hundred years before, the tribe that lived in the territory beyond the lake began their annual medicine-making ceremonies on the big rock bluff at the northern end. But no medicine could be made. The spirits, declared the chief medicine man, would not answer. They were offended. An investigation followed. It was discovered that a young brave had recently killed a wolf, a thing strictly forbidden, since the wolf was the totem animal of the tribe. To make matters worse, the name of the guilty man was Running Wolf. The offense being unpardonable, the man was cursed and driven from the tribe. Go out, wander alone among the woods, and if we see you, we slay you. Your bones shall be scattered in the forest, and your spirit shall not enter the happy hunting grounds till one of another race shall find and bury them. Which meant, explained Morton laconically, his only comment on the story, probably forever. End of Running Wolf